Thank you for, for coming. All right, well, everyone settle down very quickly. Um, well, we're here today to talk about social democracy. We have a, uh, the only social democratic Trotskyist in the room. And I'm going to present. Uh, Jonah Birch is a contributing editor of Jacobin. He's, he's written some of our finest pieces. One's a very long history of the evolution of the French Socialist Party, uh, Francois Mitterrand's uh, 1980s uh, government. You know, his kind of history before that, I would advise you to uh, check it out. I think that will give, um, you know, build on what he's going to say today. Uh, Joan is also a, a PhD student at New York University, hopefully not for too much longer. Uh, um, and, and he really... Uh, uh, he, he really uh, knows what he's talking about in this, this field. When I was um, working on a, a, a book that has a small chapter on social democracy, I asked Jonah for reading tips, and I got back um, about 32 book suggestions, a bunch of articles and attachments and all that within about two hours. So um, hopefully he you know, has a lot to say. I'll try to, I'll try to keep, keep things moving after that. I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll have a, a Q&A. Uh, well, after an introduction like that, how can I go on? Uh, thanks for coming out. I guess I wanted to start by talking about uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the, uh, the, the recent election in Britain, which I'm sure many people here followed, and the, the really shocking outcome. And, uh, you know, the Conservatives were, were uh, again, were the largest party in Parliament coming out of the election but it was much closer than, than anyone expected uh, the outcome and, and was a real, real shock to people uh, and the change in the polls was, was really dramatic and it looks like now it's, there's quite a strong possibility that Jeremy Corbyn, who is a socialist in the Labour Party, is going to be the next Prime Minister of Britain. I mean, that, that, that is something that looks like it, it might well be coming down the pike uh, if you look at, look at the poll numbers. Um, and for the Labour right, which has been attacking Corbyn uh, since he was elected a leader of the party in 2015. This was, this was quite a comeuppance and something I think that we should, we should celebrate. Last summer when uh, a number of parliamentarians from the, the British Labour Party people to Jeremy Corbyn's right uh, tried to have him removed as party leader, uh, there were a, a, an endless series of statements in the press attacking him, his leadership, his ability to, to win elections. Uh, Sidi Khan, the mayor of London, wrote, quote, Jeremy has already proved that he is unable to organize an effective team and has failed to win the trust and respect of the British people. Whoops. Uh, uh, Lord Peter Mandelson, uh, who was Tony Blair's media and uh, communication advisor, one of the architects of new labor uh, uh, policies from the mid-1990s, uh, wrote, quote, labor is facing the fight of its life to remain a viable party of government. Again, whoops. Uh, but, but I think the, 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 the best quote of all came from Tony Blair himself, one of the, obviously one of the people who launched the, the Iraq War, and uh, someone who uh, I think Jeremy Corbyn agrees is a war criminal who should, who should go on, on, on trial for, for his crimes in Iraq. And he, he uh, summed up the revulsion of uh, people in, in his current of the Labour Party uh, when he said that uh, Corbyn's ideas, uh, he said of them, quote, we wouldn't want to win on an old-fashioned leftist platform. Even if we thought it was the route to victory, we shouldn't take it. Which I think says something profound about the level of principle in, in, involved in uh, this fight for those people. Uh, and it brings to mind uh, uh, a great quote from Corbyn's mentor, the longtime uh, left labor MP, Tony Benn, who once said, The Labor Party's never been a socialist party, but it's always had socialists in it, just as there are some Christians in the church it's an exact parallel. <laughs> I think maybe the number of socialists in the Labour Party is growing right now, and that's something, that's something to be excited about. It's also worth thinking about uh, just, just how far the Labour Party has been transformed in the last four years. And it really says something about the trajectory of European social democratic parties in, in general. Uh, in the middle of the 1970s, uh, a, a Labour government was elected, a, a, a guy named Harold Wilson, who had previously been Prime Minister from 64 to 70 and had really disappointed a lot of the more left-wing uh, left supporters. Um, and in some ways that disappointment fueled the growth of the, the new left. Harold Wilson, uh, in a lot of ways, represented the right wing of the Labour Party. 
But when he was elected in, 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 the, the, in 1974, his election manifesto was something that, if you read it today, it, it sounds like a radical left-wing platform. In, in a lot of ways, it's way to the left of anything that even Corbyn is proposing right now. The election manifesto, uh, called Labor's Way Out of the Crisis, promised to, quote, substantially extend public enterprise by taking mineral, mineral rights. We shall also take shipbuilding, ship repairing, and marine engineering ports, the manufacture of airframes and aero engine, en engines, quite a British term, I guess, uh, into public ownership and control. But we shall not confine the extension of the public sector to the loss-making and subsidized industries. We shall also take over profitable sections or individual firms in those industries where a public holding is essential to enable the government to control prices, stimulate investment, encourage exports, create employment, protect workers and consumers from the activities of irresponsible multinational companies, and play in the national economy and the national interest. We shall therefore include in this operation sections of pharmaceuticals, road haulage, construction, machine tools, in addition to our proposals for North Sea and, and Celtic Sea oil and gas, our decision in the field of banking, insurance, and building societies is still under consideration. Uh, now, what's so shocking about this, when you, it, it was that the Wilson government, and, and then Wilson's successor, uh, uh, Callahan, who, who took over from him in 1976, I mean, in a lot of ways, pioneered British neoliberalism in, in response to the, uh, the growing crisis of, of British capitalism in the late 1970s. Uh, Callahan uh, uh, gave a speech at, a, a, at the 1976 Labor Party conference in which he very famously said, uh, essentially, we can't go on in the old way. We no longer think you can spend your way out of the crisis uh, and then move to, to, to limit spending and, 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 and cut taxes uh, in, in a way that, that, that really that sort of set the stage for what uh, Thatcher, Thatcher would do uh, in the next decade. And, and it, it, the 1970s in this way turned out to be a, a, a really profound, a turning point for social democracy. In some ways, the peak of its radicalization, uh, of, uh, and, and it was the decade that marked the growth of a social democratic left in parties all over Europe. It also uh, marked uh, the, the, the onset of crisis and the end of the long post-war, World War II economic boom. Uh, and and it, in, in that way, uh, uh, it, it began the transformation of, of social democracy towards what we recognize, we recognize right now. Now, if you look at the Labor Party today, it's obviously, it's, it's going in one direction. Uh, on the other end of the, uh, the spectrum in terms of European social democratic parties, you can look at the French Socialist Party, which is in, it, it essentially is undergoing its collapse right now. Uh, and people might have seen there is a, uh, a new president in France, someone who served in the last socialist-led government, which really drove uh, 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 labor market uh, reforms and austerity policies uh, to, 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 to move the French economy in a neoliberal direction. Uh, and, and he, he uh, has built his own party and taken a big chunk uh, of what was the French Socialist Party and, and, and uh, the, the remaining rump. Uh, is is in such a such such free fall that its own presidential candidate uh, uh, Benoit Hamon just resigned from the party about a month after losing the election. So it, it's in collapse now. It, that is a party that was built in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, uh, at the end of the 1960s and during the 1970s, during the peak of this radicalization and it, its its origins. If you look at the beginning of it, it really kind of it, it expressed it expressed that leftward turn in social democracy. Francois Mitterrand, later the, the president of France, again, someone who would pioneer French neoliberalism uh, in a lot of ways. When he uh, entered the party and was uh, elected its leader in its 1971 uh, Epinay Congress, Mitterrand said uh, in a speech to the delegates, reform or revolution? I want to say, yes, revolution. And I would immediately point out the daily struggle for structural reforms can be revolutionary in nature. But what I have just said uh, uh, could be an alibi if I did not add a second sen sentence. Violent or peaceful, revolution is first of all a break. He who does not accept the break and the method that follows from it, one who is not willing to break with the established order, with capitalist society, that person, I say, cannot be a member of the Socialist Party. And later at a press conference after, after the Congress, Mitterrand said, quote, you can be a manager of capitalist society or a founder of a socialist society. As far as we're concerned, we want to be uh, the second. And if you look at the transformation between that and, and the Hollande government that, that has ruled France over the, 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 the last five years, it's, 
you know, it's something uh, that, that is really dramatic and, and, and something that's very stark. And I think it's important to, for us uh, on the far left to, to understand how this happened and, and uh, what, what, what happened here, in part because uh, contrary to predictions of, of many people who, who have our, our politics, far left politics, uh, over the last 40 years, the sort of uh, the betrayal, as they thought of it, of, of social democratic governments did not usually lead to a radicalization, a, a leftward turn among people who supported those governments. In fact, quite the opposite. It has been, uh, it has been uh, concomitant with uh, uh, the collapse of, of traditional institutions of the labor movement and really a dramatic weakening of all of the organizations of the far left. There's no way around it over the last 40 years. Social, demo social democracy's neoliberal turn ha ha has uh, run in parallel with, with our decline, with the decline of the far left. Uh, and, and, to, and, and that, I think, is something that, that it's very important for us to... To, to recognize and to grapple with. Now, in, in thinking about why that's the case uh, and, and what it was that, that has hurt both us and the Social Democrats, I think you have to start with the, the, the fact that the, the crisis of the 1970s and the, the period of economic uh, restructuring that came out of it had a dramatic impact on the workers' movement. And you see it in terms of declining unionization rates pretty much all over Western Europe. The timing differed from country to country a breakdown of some of the institutions of collective bargaining that kind of underpinned labor's power. You see it in, in, in falling strike rates. I mean, after reaching their peak in the 1970s, strike rates plummeted. I mean, today, in, uh, in large parts of Western Europe, there are essentially uh, zero strikes in the private sector. You, you, you see almost no strikes in the private sector, uh, uh, usually. Uh, and that, that process tightened the constraints that always limited social democracy's move, room to maneuver, but it also undermined the basis for working class militancy. The period of full employment that followed World War II, the quote unquote golden age of capitalism, uh, you know, in the context of uh, uh, one to two percent unemployment rates, workers had a lot of confidence to fight their boss, to go out on strike, it's very easy. Uh, when your boss comes to you and says, I want speed ups, I want wage cuts, to say, well, screw yourself, you know what I mean, if, when, when, if it's going to be impossible for them to replace you. And the onset of mass unemployment after that, and the disorganization of the class that went along with it, has had a, a, a devastating impact uh, on, on working class uh, militancy. Now, this played out, uh, you know, in different ways, in, in, in different places, and that, that kind of, the, the transition away from the model of, of reformism that dominated in the period after, after World War II uh, played out differently in different places. You know, and uh, people think when they think of Britain, for example, they think of the, the, the very aggressive kind of assault, neoliberal assault, launched by the Thatcher government in, in the 1980s. Uh, in, in France, uh, in, in Mitterrand, uh, who tried to implement a whole series of reforms when he came to power uh, in 1981, soon found himself uh, uh, limited by the, the range of difficulties uh, that French capitalism faced and undertook a, a, what was called a turn towards a, a, a rigueur or austerity uh, in 1982-83 and backtracked on, uh, uh, on a whole bunch of promises. Uh, and and for, the, for the left wing of social democratic parties, you know, that, that, that was really a, a, a moment in which a lot of the hopes that kind of animated people uh, through the 1970s um, fell apart. Now in Britain at the exact same time, there was a labor left that was contending, contending for power uh, and Tony Benn uh, famously ran for the deputy Labor Party leadership. Uh, labor had a relatively uh, left-wing uh, election platform in 1983, uh, an election which they got crushed and the, the, the platform was uh, famously called the longest suicide note in history. Something that I think is an unfair characterization by Joe Kaufman actually. Just died the, the 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 labor MP, but I think there was a, a real sense or, or, or a hope uh, that that there that that the crisis and the the kind of rightward turn in official politics, the turn towards austerity, was going to lead uh, a, a chunk of a chunk of these parties uh, or at least of their bases uh, uh, to to move to move to the left, as Marcel Liebman and Ralph Milliman uh, wrote in 1985. Again and again, social democratic governments have been elected with substantial, sometimes sweeping, 
parliamentary and popular majorities on programs of extensive reform and renewal in a climate of genuine enthusiasm and support, and have very soon flagged and dissipated that enthusiasm and support and re retreated into the positions and policies uh, 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 of neoliberalism, essentially. And, and people on the far left, like, um, um, you know, like uh, uh, people from our tradition, uh, there, was a, there was an expectation that, uh, that, that this was going to uh, lead to at least a section of those parties uh, to embrace more, more, radical, more radical politics. Uh, uh, and and that, obviously, that obviously didn't happen. Uh, and there were battles in, in lots, of, lots of these parties. In the British Labour Party, uh, uh, for example, it took a, a whole campaign to, to drive the left wing of uh, uh, the, the left wing out, or to, to, to kind of neuter it during during the, the 80s and uh, into the 90s. Uh, but by the 1990s, you saw the emergence of in, in parties all over Europe a, a kind of neoliberal consensus that that culminated in. Uh, what was known as the third way, right? That the British Labour and the, the German Social Democrats uh, kind of define their, 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 their politics in terms of, this is a term that comes from the sociologist Anthony Giddens, the house ideologue of new labor. Uh, the third way between, between the market and the state, uh, between socialism and capitalism, the idea is we, we are pioneering a, 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 a third way. Uh, and that involved a, a turn towards uh, a dramatic uh, neoliberal policies, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, an abandonment of kind of the welfare state Keynesianism that had that had dominated uh, social democratic part parties uh, policies in the 1960s uh, at, 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 and the 1970s. And during this period, it's it's worth it to say. It, I mean, it's fascinating. You know, uh, social democratic governments in a lot of countries face serious resistance. When uh, Gerhard Schroeder, the leader of the German Social Democrats, who elected in 1998 at the head of a red-green coalition government on the basis of a, a relatively left-wing uh, 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 election platform, and who promised sort of a, a return to more, more spending, a, a, a kind of a pro-labor uh, strategy for dealing with what in Germany were very high uh, unemployment rates at the time, uh, when he turned dramatically towards austerity and welfare cuts, implemented his famous hearts uh, welfare reforms, a, a whole chunk of the party split away uh, and formed, uh, 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 ended up joining uh, what, what be turned into what is now the left party. Uh, actually, in Britain was the place where by this point, you know, when by the time Tony Blair came into office, resistance to that neoliberal turn uh, was the weakest. There was, there, there was essentially no resistance uh, uh, to, to new labor and that, that process of disorganization, the disillusionment that Tony Blair and, 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 uh, uh, kind of marked, uh, and you saw it in all sorts of ways, rising abstention rates, collapsing membership numbers. At its lowest, I think the British Labour Party uh, it, it fell to something like 160,000 members. Now it's at something like 600,000, I mean, uh, since the, the, Corbyn, the Corbyn surge. But that, that disillusionment uh, you know, led people uh, to retreat and, and to kind of fall back from, uh, uh, you know, from the hopes that, that, that had previously animated them. And, and on the far left, I mean, I, I have a whole series of quotes. I'm not sure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them all. But let me just say that, uh, you know, in Britain, people on the, on the radical and the revolutionary left, uh, people like Tony Cliff, for example, someone who was very influential in the, the, in the current, that th this conference is, ba is, uh, is based on, they expected that Blair's election was going to uh, lead to a, some kind of upsurge, a period of renewed struggle and renewed strikes that didn't happen. That, that didn't happen, and in fact, uh, what you saw over the long term was, was again, this kind of retreat, retreat of the left uh, uh, and of, of the far left. Um, you know, and, and, and that, that is something that I think that we're, we're, still, we're still grappling with today. After, after 20 years, 25 years of, of kind of hard neoliberal politics uh, by, by social democratic governments and parties, uh, clearly there's some kind of uh, revolt happening uh, uh, at, at the base now, finally. Uh, you're not seeing it in terms of strike rates. It's still very, very difficult for people to go out uh, and fight the boss. Uh, it, it, instead, what you're seeing is people looking for new kinds of reformist alternatives at this point. Uh, and so, of course, the, the, the Corbyn represents that in a very profound way. Uh, in other countries, you see it in terms of the emergence of 
new kinds of reformist parties. You saw in the election in France this year, the rise of France Insoumise and the, the, the candidacy of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who got about 20% of the vote in the first round of the presidential election. You see it in terms of the rise of Podemos uh, in Spain. Um, and I would just say that for, for people who want to see some, some, some more profound transformation of capitalism or, or some kind of revolutionary politics emerge, you know, this is something that's a very, very positive development. That the collapse of social democracy uh, it, since the 1970s um, ha has, been, uh, has had a devastating effect uh, for us. It's been something that's been a, a, a major blow. In the absence of reformist politics, people haven't been turning to the left. They've essentially been retreating from political life in general. And that, that confidence uh, to go out on strike has continued to, and to fight the boss has, has continued to dissipate. As if we want to see some kind of radicalization over, over the, the longer term, uh, it's inevitable, natural, that people are going to go through periods of, uh, 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 in which they're experimenting with different types of reformist politics. And that's something that we, we should engage with and, and, and think seriously about. Now, what that looks like in different countries, I, I think, is going to differ quite a bit. I'm, you know, I, I know there's a debate in Britain about whether to join the Labour Party or... Uh, but, uh, uh, but more broadly, we want to be relating to these people, obviously, and we want to be engaged with them as they go through the, the, that process of getting repoliticized and, and, and uh, uh, sort of getting, getting back on the, the, political, the political field. The one thing I would say is that uh, in the medium to long term, um, you know, uh, if in the absence of extra parliamentary movements or of strikes, unless we can figure out how to beat, fight the boss in the workplace, there are going to be real limits to how far that kind of reformism uh, is going to, going to be able to go. I mean, if Jeremy Corbyn got elected, he'd face many of the same constraints that, uh, that, uh, limited, uh, uh, um, uh, that limited Mitterrand uh, and in terms of not just, even if it's a different context economically, maybe not the exact same straight constraints in terms of economic crisis, but the pol all the political pressures, the conflicts that come along with, uh, that, with challenging capital. Uh, and I want to read a quote from, uh, from Chris Harmon, who was talking about what would happen if Tony Benn were in the early 80s uh, were to, to, to come to power. And I think that, you know, it's something that, that is still a, a danger, a, a possibility uh, for the next Corbyn government. He said, in the London clubs and, and at society balls, in officers' messes and at legal dinners, there will be open talk of resistance. Oh, whoops, sorry. My bad. There will be open talk of resistance. The Telegraph, the Mail, the Express will shriek bitterly. They, they, they will still shriek bitterly. Uh, there could even be abortive attempts by sections of the ruling class to unseat the government immediately, but the bulk of the ruling class, the most experienced capitalist class in the world, in England, we might contest that in the United States, <laughs> will react rather differently. The inner enclaves of the Bank of England, the CBI, the Treasury, the big banks, will endeavor, endeavor to work out a coherent strategy for dealing with the government. If indeed it has popular support, they will disown any premature attempts against it. Instead, they will put it quite bluntly to the radical ministers that they will cooperate with them, providing the cooperation is reciprocated. In this way, they will embroil the government in their own tentacles, progressively reducing its opportunities for radical action at a later stage. And meanwhile, they will expect that as the normal symptoms of capitalist crisis continue to express themselves, aggravated by the lack of confidence of big sections of capital in the government, Unemployment will grow, prices will soar, the government will lose its popularity, and the ground will be prepared for a more direct ruling class assault uh, upon it at, at a later stage. Uh, and, 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 you know, and one of the things that he's getting at here, something I, I get at in this article about Mithmond, is that you know, the political power of the capitalist class works in many different ways. Uh, it works through its institutions uh, and, uh, you know, and through uh, the kind of the, the institutions of the media and uh, the, of the state, but above all, uh, it, it's based not on what capital, capital does, but what it can choose not to do, uh, which is invest. That kind of structural power and the, the logic that flows from it, the, the need to appease capital to create, to maintain a climate of business confidence as the basis for any redistributive or radical uh, uh, reforms that one, one might institute, it, it's something that is, is it, it, it exerts pressure on, on, on reformist governments. It exerts pressure on, on, on workers themselves. It's something that everyone 
uh, has, to take, has to take seriously. And overcoming that requires a, a very highly mobilized uh, working class base, uh, a, a base that's well organized and, and, and has uh, uh, really, yeah, the ability and the confidence to, to challenge, challenge the capital at, at multiple, multiple levels. We have to figure out how to get there. Right? You know what I mean? That's, that's eventually where, 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 we need, where we need to go. Now, how to do that, I, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't have all the answers to that. Uh, but I do think that you, just to say that uh, a return of reformism is something that, that we should take very, very seriously and, and, and something, to be, something to be hopeful about. Thank you. All right, so there was, there was a lot there covered in 25, uh, 25 minutes. I guess let's say you, you, you mentioned that um, that uh, Callahan uh, quote uh, from from the seventies, but that quote I'm not I'm not sure of the exact context of it, but it could have very well been responding to not just Labor Party government practices, but even the kind of reflationary politics uh, policies of the Conservative Party at that, that time, because even large segments of the British ruling class still thought the old kind of way out of the crisis of the seventies was gonna was gonna work. So I, I guess what I'm what I'm asking is, obviously the new labor and all these other forces were responding to a real crisis in the the 70s, and in France we saw kind of the limits and the failures of a left social democratic um, program. So to what extent, um, you know, like wh where do you where do you root this kind of uh, crisis, and can we even imagine a successful social democratic? Uh, program with the barriers just be political barriers. Are there new barriers that are economic, based on so not just what you were mentioning the you know kind of the decline of mass activity of mass politics in the working class, but as far as you know globalization and whatnot that makes capital flight or capital strikes um, you know more more potent. Uh, so to what extent were, was new labor uh, responding to something real? To what extent was it? Um, you know, just merely kind of an ideological and political shift. Well, there was a real, so there was a real crisis of capitalism in the 1970s and a profound one. Uh, and it's true that governments of both the left and the right all over Europe responded in kind of a vacillating way and they, it, it, policies changed uh, from year to year before the sort of decisive turn and towards austerity, uh, austerity was made. Um, it, Obviously, it's a very different context right now. Uh, in some ways, the, 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 we're not at quite. In some ways, the challenges are, are are less. We're not at the same depths of the crisis that existed in in the 1970s and the 1980s. I know people are. Some people disagree with that. Charlie Post out there is definitely going to disagree with that. Uh, um, I, I think. Um, I think that the dangers of things like capital flight are, uh, so that's what essentially brought down the Mitterrand government, right? They, they tried to spend their way out of the crisis, uh, and, uh, and there was huge capital flight, uh, and capital stopped investing. And it meant that as people got more money, uh, they weren't buying uh, products made uh, by, by French producers, they were, having to, they were buying imported products. And that put a huge amount of pressure on the French franc and, and led to a, 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 you know, a, a huge balance of payment deficit. In other words, they were, they were buying too much from abroad more than they were selling. It was a huge increase of both consumption and, and of uh, imports. Capital flight is always a danger. Uh, whether, I, I think there's a degree to which um, um, things like globalization, the effects of it, and the inability of governments to kind of defend their economic boundaries and to prevent the movements of capital uh, is overstated by people like Giddens who say there is no alternative to neoliberalism, that there's nothing you can do, that international markets have too much power and uh, the economy is too globalized and if you try and do reformism in one country, you're just going to see, uh, you're just going to uh, see capital say, okay, well, we're going to go, we're going to pick up and, and, and go, go elsewhere. The, the constraints that, that, that governments do face differ quite a bit from, from country to country. If you're in Greece, reformism in one country is going to be a very challenging prospect, obviously. You know, if you're in France, the constraints are probably going to be a little bit less, although they'll, they, they will still be there. Above all, uh, if, if you want to confront uh, capital uh, right now, 
you, you have to be prepared. You have to have a serious plan for dealing with the consequences and the fallout from that. And the, the consequences can be quite, quite severe uh, in, in terms of that disinvestment or the refusal of capital, capital to play, play ball. Um, and if you're not prepared for that, you know, you're going to run up against limits that you're going to retreat from. At the end of the day, what happened to Francois Mitterrand, it was not, uh, it was the, the, just thinking about it in terms of betrayal does not ad adequately capture uh, the dynamics of, of what was happening. The government did try and implement something, a reformist program. In fact, uh, for us, it, it would look like quite a radical reformist program. They're, they reduced the working week to 39 hours, the plans to reduce it to 35. There was a huge increase in spending. They nationalized big, big chunks of the economy, added a fifth week of paid vacation. Uh, but, but at a certain point when they ran up against the, the limits the capital set, they, they weren't willing or able to, to go beyond those. And, and that always is, is you know, if, I mean, that's, that's something that, that you're, you're always going to face if you try and uh, implement that kind of uh, left-wing reforms program. Uh, were there elements within social democracy that, that recognized the need to um, control, uh, I guess, capitalist um, kind of domination of investment, control of investment, where it derives power, like either the, the minor plan and um, or the revised minor plan in, in Sweden or other cases, or do you think that most of social democracy, even its left wing, didn't fully under, understand, um, you know, uh, the pressures that was under? Uh, well, there were big, yeah, there were big fights internally. I mean, definitely you saw something like the Minor Plan, which came out of the Swedish labor movement, which was a plan to gradually buy up uh, ownership in, in big corporations uh, by using uh, workers' uh, social security uh, contributions. Uh, and, and something that capital essentially said, we're drawing a red business, drew a red line on, and they were not able to implement it. In, in France, uh, uh, under Mitterrand, there were big fights within the cabinet. It was a coalition government, so some of the more left-wing socialists, uh, and as well as the Communist Party ministers, wa wanted to kind of deepen the reformist strategy, whereas um, a lot of the kind of leading figures in the, the more centrist uh, wings of the, the Socialist Party wanted to, to kind of like cut bait and run. And, and retreat on what they had tried to do. There, there were those battles, and of course people recognized that the constraints were, were very real uh, and very heavy. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, the, it, the disruption that would have been involved with, with continuing to fight capital or to extending that battle uh, were, were something that just seemed too, too dangerous to people like Mitterrand and, and was not something that they were going to do, um, you know, and, and something that they were afraid of, of undertaking. Um, but of course, there were people who recognized that it was you had to go one way or the other. So, so I have two more questions that are short and kind of related. Um, what, what would be, of course, there was this this strain of thinking in, let's say, the UK around um, uh, Marxism today, and which you know Hobsbawm, Stuart Hall, and others were all um, to various degrees, you know, uh, pushing um, that that you know made the argument that there was among other things, a sociological shift. The basis of left-wing politics as it had existed, socialist politics between 1860s and like the 1970s, had a certain sociological form. It was heavily, uh, it, was, it was urban, it, was, it had a preponderant role of the industrial proletariat and, and whatnot, and conditions had changed to the extent that we needed to look for um, new agents, or at least expand our vision out towards you know, winning greater, you know, consent from uh, the middle classes and from, uh, from others. Um, and, you know, obviously we reject that view politically, but even today with the uh, Corbyn phenomenon, it seems like even though labor is resurgent, laborism is still um, dead. Um, you know, working class, um, traditional working class kind of vote, vote shares are, are not very high for, for labor. Participation is very very low. Uh, Corbyn won over um, new segments of the professional class. It won over like lots of like, kind of a cross-class youth youth vote and 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 whatnot. Do you envision kind of um, the new um, reformism as as having kind of a or having the potential to have as deep of class roots as as the old you know reformism did? I mean, I think that depends on whether we can reorganize the class. And probably people in this room are better equipped to talk about that than, 
than I am. Of course, it's good to win over sections of the middle class. That's, that's always a, a positive thing. But you do want to have a class politics that at the end of the day, you have to have some kind of social roots in, in the class. Now, the class has changed quite a bit, obviously. You know, so that's going to involve different kinds of dilemmas and, and, and uh, uh, different sorts of strategies in terms of organizing people. But we do want to see a revival of, of class politics. And, and in, in some ways, the, you know, like the third way and the, the, the kind of neoliberal turn in, in social democracy involved very much an abandonment of class politics. And uh, Tony, Tony Blair said, you know, the era of class warfare is over. But, you know, and, and, you know, and that was really the strategy. The idea is we're going to win over more middle class voters and be, become kind of parties of the urban middle class. And, and in the long run, actually, what that did was, was just f further erode the, the, the working class base of traditional uh, reformist parties and, and weaken them. And, uh, you know, this kind of the, the idea that if we, if we move to the center and, and shed the old, the old labor image, will become more appealing to these kind of uh, middle class liberals. People talk about, what, what is it? So I'm socially liberal, but economically, what, what is it? Conservative. Conservative, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that, that kind of uh, short term electoral <laughs> thinking had, had, had very long term, uh, uh, very heavy long term costs. Yeah. Uh, I guess my, my last question was kind of, how do you, do, do you envision, when you think about um, the future prospects or, for radical politics or, or even bringing about the kind of you know, forces that would want to uh, you know, be able to push a socialist transformation, do you envision it as kind of, first we rebuild kind of the basis for social democratic government, essentially, uh, then there's forces on the left that as it encounters contradictions, we just basically replayed the 70s, except now our forces on the left are, are stronger and we could actually you know, push through. Is that kind of the social democratic road to communism? Or do you think that there was something very peculiar about this kind of post-war period and the post-war exception that actually made even that brief period of social democratic governance possible and we might need to kind of skip, skip steps this time? So that's a terribly broad question. But to the extent that, that post-war social democracy, the strategy was predicated on a, a sort of class compromise that involved the trades of, uh, you know, essentially where social democrats were really strong, what they traded was social peace in return for uh, rising wages and living standards and expanded social safety net and, and greater influence at the shop floor level. Like, it's very difficult for us in this country to imagine what it looked like in places where uh, you were represented not just by a, a strong trade union that negotiated your wage increase every year at a, at a, at, you know, at a sector or national level, even in Sweden at the national level, they set wages for all the workers uh, in the economy, but also in your workplace. There are a whole variety of works councils and health and safety committees uh, where, so that like, you know, if you had a problem at your job, you were organized enough on the shop floor that you could get it taken care of. I mean, that's something that really existed in places where, where social democracy was strong, and, and, and along with a, a whole range of added benefits. It, it must be amazing. I mean, even now, Denmark, which is this ridiculous model of, uh, has sort of celebrated by European neoliberal ideologues as, uh, uh, for its so-called flex security mo model, which involves uh, f labor market flexibility so that your boss can tell you whenever you're fired, but with lots and lots of, of social protections. You know, in Denmark right now, if you have a baby, the government gives you a bunch of money. If you have a second baby, the government gives you even more money. When you get married, the government gives you money. When you, you, know, when you buy a house, the government gives you money. It just shows up in your bank account. That, for us, would be something that, that seems really remarkable, kind of <laughs> fruits of, of social democracy, totally. You know, not to mention free childcare. Uh, 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 but there was this class compromise, and, and the, the class compromise that existed after World War II, I think, is dead. What, what that means in terms of a strategy for, 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 for well, for uh, the, the kind of new reformist parties and for people on the, 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 the radical left and, and, you know, people who are considering themselves revolutionaries, I don't know, we'll have to make it up as we, we go along. What, the, what is the Napoleon quote that Lenin loved? En sondage et puis on voit. Well, you, you do it, and then you see, you know, so I, I don't know how that will work. All right. <laughs> Joanna Birch endorses the true original Bonapartism, you know. Um, all right, so I guess we're going to have uh, some questions from the, the audience. Uh,